This is Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. I'm Jess Khanam. And this is Jamal Dejani. Jamal, we have a fantastic show today. We're actually very um, fortunate to have in studio with us today two amazing guests. And we're, we've been talking about Islamophobia for such a long time. That's right. We tend to get overly focused on Islamophobia here in the United States. But we actually have two experts talking about probably the place in the world where Islamophobia is probably even at its worst, and that's in France. Well, it's in France. It's also all over Europe. And uh, so we're very fortunate to have with us in the studio, live right here in the studio, Jess, uh, Shafika Atalay and Isis Kar. And they are from the Collective Against Islamophobia in France, uh, CCIF. It's a nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm in France and they're right here, uh, I guess, touring the country or at least in the Bay Area and talking to different uh, people, trying to kind of compare and contrast mm -hmm. and, edu educate us. and educate mm -hmm. the public about what they have been doing. Welcome to Arab Talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Yeah, so, so let's just get started quickly. Uh, just tell us a little bit about your organization, really, the uh, CCIF. All right, so we are the Collective Against Islamophobia in France, uh, active for almost 20 years. Uh, we have a legal department with a bunch of jurists which accompany the victims of Islamophobia along their uh, legal proceedings. Um, we yeah, will help them to, we teach them their rights, how to react uh, in front of Islamophobia uh, in an Islamophobic situation and also uh, how to uh, reassert their, their, their rights uh, when victims of Islamophobia, mainly. So people who face issues in, in France, they contact your organization and then you help them in providing, is it free legal help? Yeah, essentially what we do is we receive dozens of calls of victims uh, a day and we'll provide legal assistance, maybe psychological support. Mm -hmm. um, and then that'll help us gather data on the state of Islamophobia in France, how many um, act, how many uh, acts are act, Islamophobic acts are taken against the uh, victims? It, uh, who's, what's the source? Is it institutions? Is it private individuals, etc? Um, and then we'll accompany them throughout the legal proceedings. Either we'll help them financially with uh, lawyer fees. We don't have the pro bono process in France. Mm -hmm. There isn't such a thing. Oh, really? So, yeah, no. Uh, so, you have to pay the money. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. So what, what's your background, both of you? Um, so I essentially have a legal background. I've studied American, British, and French law. Wow. Uh, yeah. Impressive. Yeah, so it helps me a lot with uh, institutional Islamophobia. And I, uh, I graduated in international relations in Brussels with uh, it was paralingual and uh, international relations, specializing to European institutions and European advocacy. Well, I guess one of the questions I'd like to maybe begin with, um, I mean, in the United States, we sometimes start the, the emergence, the strong emergence of Islamophobia with 9-11. Right. That even though it's been going on for much longer before that. In France, what would you say, was there a turning point? Was there a moment? What is the historical context? I mean, we know about the immigration, we know about the war, the, the colonization and decolonization, but when did it really become like an issue with a word like Islamophobia? Um, so I think the same kind of tipping point, obviously differently because these are different countries with different contexts, but the same kind of tipping point was probably the first uh, terror attacks in Paris in yes. 2015. Um, following that, there was a state of emergency mm -hmm. right. that was issued. But also, I'd say that it's the same turning point. I'd say that mm -hmm. it's also after what happened in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, you think so? I think yeah. so, yeah, because we observe Islamophobia for now for almost 20 years. Uh, it was straight after the the, the the attacks that occurred, the, the, the whole stuff that occurred in the U.S. I, for me, it's the turning point in France, but it's, uh, it kind of has um, emerged much more after yes. the terrorist attacks in 2015. Right. Yeah. Right. So I know uh, France has laws uh, affecting Muslim, especially Muslim women, 
uh, laicite yeah. uh, <laughs> against the full R, yeah. right? So uh, laicite is the law not to wear uh, religious covers like the hijab. That's that's at least. So well, they've been targeting in a way women, and then most recently we've been reading that women who were the uh, burkini, yeah. mm -hmm. they weren't allowed to enter in into so public they, beaches yeah. and swimming pools. So there there were some reaction to this where women try to support yes. women basically. So there is also an ex, uh, I would say an accelerated or a targeted attack not only against. Uh, French Muslims, and but they're focusing on women in particular. Exactly, exactly. If I may, um, what a thing that we have observed in uh, within the CCIF is that Islamophobia is a gendered racism. Uh, up, it, it it targets women up to seventy five percent. Wow. So yeah, it's clearly a gendered racism. Uh, women are targeted into all sphere of the society. It means at work. If you have a headscarf, you cannot work. Nobody will hire you. Uh, or worst, they will fire you under another reason, of course. They are targeted at, uh, in the educational sphere. So uh, you have the access to some trainings. You, your access to some trainings is refused. Uh, you are targeted in public services like swimming pools, like um, this kind of stuff. But clearly, if you are a woman in France, a visible Muslim woman with a headscarf, a turban, something like this, a long dress, mm -hmm. you are a victim of racism. Mm -hmm. It's blatant. Very ha much so. Has this manifested into violence, also physical violence, or just like discrimination at work? Both, both. 80% uh, of Islamophobia is discrimination, but then you cannot ignore the rest. The rest is hate, hateful, um, hate speech, mm -hmm. but also hate crime, violence, physical and psychological violence. Degradation both. against mosques. Degradation against mm. mosques or other centers. But when it's about the violence, uh, it, it's it's very it's really violent actions. It means um, uh, women are targeted. They are run over in the street with their pram with their children. Uh, these are really violent actions. Mm -hmm. And I think just to take it back, uh, you originally talked about laicity, mm -hmm. just to replace the context, because obviously these are two very different countries. I'm always uh, astonished when I see uh, in God we trust in courtrooms and, you know, right. the, the president pledging allegiance on the Bible, etc. In France, right. we had a law in 1905, okay. um, basically legal. Um, institutionalizing secular secularism mm -hmm. in a particular way which is laicite is supposed to touch only the state only the state has the obligation to be neutral so is it different than separation of church and state or is it the it same is, no it is separation of church and state that ex that's exactly what it okay. is mm -hmm. um, right. it's more than that it means that the state shouldn't and can't control or be controlled by religion mm -hmm. but today it's being um, manipulated in a way where it's we're using um, people are using laicity mm -hmm. to impose a kind of form of private secularism mm -hmm. almost like especially Muslims, obviously, but people of uh, practicing faith um, should need to present themselves as non-practicing to go to work, to go to school, yeah. or to ha have any job in a public institution. Yeah. Maybe in other words, uh, in France, the, this whole concept around laicite mm -hmm. means that only the civil service has to be laic, has okay. to be neutral. Okay. However, the users of mm -hmm. the civil service don't have to. Mm -hmm. But now we are using this concept of laicity mm -hmm. to prohibit everything mm -hmm. to the Muslim community. Right. So right now, if you are a mother and you want to to go to accompany your children in school outing, mm -hmm. normally, if you take the law, you are totally right to go with your headscarf. But now they are doing a whole a whole fuss around this around this topic, around the fact that Muslim mothers veiled Muslim mothers mm -hmm. accompany their children in school outing, saying that it's illegal, saying that they cannot. Well, but in, in the fact, it is authorized, they can, this is their rights, right. you know? Mm -hmm. But they use this concept of laicity to try to impede them from doing it. Mm -hmm. How do the French reconcile? Uh, I mean, I went to a French Catholic school, yeah. and uh, they taught us from the beginning, you know, uh, Liberté, égalité, fraternité, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, they 
to basically a forever, right? Mm -hmm, right? And so how do they reconcile that they are basically stripping the rights and the equality from its own citizens? Both of you were born in France, right? Yes. You grew up in yeah, France. Yeah, we both grew up in France. I love that question. That's my favorite question. Because when you see the state of Islamophobia in France, you go back and you question liberty, liberty. Do we really, do we have the same liberties as other people today in France? No. Clearly not. Egalité. Do we have a state of equality between Muslims and non-Muslims in France? Are we treated the same way? And fraternité, which is a fraternity, solidarity. Mm -hmm. Is there any form of solidarity between Muslims and non-Muslims today in France when we see blatantly um, violent acts of Islamophobia? Are attacks considered the same way? Are they uh, seen in the media in the same way? Mm -hmm. What happens when Muslims are attacked? What happens when Muslims' rights are infringed upon? Clearly not. And today, right. And mm -hmm. today, what's really interesting is to see that actually the arguments that are used to legitimize Islamophobia is liberté, égalité, right. fraternité. Right. Mm -hmm. So in the name of women's rights, mm -hmm. you will strip a woman of her clothing. In the name of women's freedom, you will stop her from exercising free choice of clothing and free choice of practice. Mm -hmm. And I'm, it's, it's really intelligent and interesting to think about mm -hmm. using these arguments that, of course, who is against women's right to choose, right? If you use that, if you use that, then you legitimize Islamophobia, right. saying that this is helping her, mm -hmm. you know, the whole notion of white savior, right? This is right. helping her. This right. is helping her. We'll tell her what it means to be free. Exactly. Mm -hmm. well, exactly. I want to I want to talk about this in a larger um, kind of context of what's been happening in Europe the last yeah. uh, 10 to 15 years, because there's been a, a wave of swinging to white supremacy mm -hmm. uh, politics. I mean, when Macron got elected, it, things really swung to the right, despite what his word said. Mm -hmm. What's happening in France? <laughs> Politically, it used to be a place of very progressive ideas and politics, and I don't see it. Was it? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. um, Historically, yeah. maybe not. There is a swing to the right, because obviously the Socialist Party was eradicated in mm -hmm. the last election. We used to have, you know, the left-wing party, right-wing party, they would always doesn't you know, exist anymore. The left wing yeah. party doesn't exist. They right. don't exist anymore. I mean, right now we have a, an issue with both far right and far left. Yeah. Both are Islamophobic, blatantly Islamophobic. S say more about public. that's a very interesting, uh, say more about that's very interesting statement. Mm -hmm. How is, I mean, I, I completely understand the far right being Islamophobic. Yeah. <laughs> what's, what's the narrative that the left are using to oppress a Muslim men and women in France now? It's partly the narrative that I just said, oh, okay. women's choice, etc. But it's also, I think, the far left historically has been um, more against religion, ideologically, right? Mm, right. right. Um, and so the left, the far left will be particular in the way that its leaders will say, I myself am Islamophobic, but I promise not to pass any Islamophobic laws because that's not constitutional, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? The far right will just say, you know, we're against Islam in this country. Uh, we are against Sharia, whatever, you know, uh, invading French values or, or whatnot. It sounds but so much like the American narrative. It's scary. Well, it's the, I, I think that um, it's the same narrative being used, but with very different historical causes. Yeah. Um, and I think that now for being elected, um, the, the elected people, the politicians use Islamophobic arguments for it in order to convince people to vote for them. So they will say, if you elect me, I, I, I promise you there won't be any mosque in this city. I will eradicate every, well, yeah. that's true. Yeah, that's no, how yeah. it happened yeah. in France. I will eradicate every mosque of, mm -hmm. the, of the city. Mm -hmm. So now even Islamophobia is becoming an argument of political elections. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so as we said, um, struggling against racism should be something that, ra that rally people together. It but doesn't. now it's the inverse, it's the opposite. It's something that rally people in order to marginalize a whole layer of the society. Right. We, we are a whole layer. I mean, Muslims are 
prominent in France. Well, 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 that's the thing, because when we talk about Islamophobia here in the United States, we, well, we can see it because the United States has a history of vilifying every ethnic mm -hmm. group, yeah. you know, starting from the indigenous uh, uh, people who were here to African Americans to uh, Jews, people who came from Ireland, Catholics, etc., go down the line, and and now we have become the plat du jour, right? So Muslims, mm -hmm. in, in this is how I look at it. Yeah. Is this is now in this context, and yet we are a minority. I mean, the Muslims um, don't have the numbers. If I'm right, in France, I think. Uh, Islam represents about 10% or more of the we population? Don't. No? We have no way of knowing. E because of um, the census. You're right. We're not allowed to have uh, to do any census based on religion in oh, France really? because of the history of World War II. That's kind of the yeah, last time yeah. the state asked people their religion. So we're but, not allowed to do that But again. in general, they can tell from Six. the origins, people coming from Northern Africa and Africa, yeah. it's a larger population. So my question is... Mm -hmm. What is the community in a way? I mean, is there, you know, a major outcry? I mean, I, I, I see like two outcries, one from the community itself, like united, uniting minorities in general, if you want to put them under the banner of minorities uniting. And then the other one is women, because this is also an gender issue. So when an attack on a Muslim woman just can be an attack on any woman for whatever reason, because historically governments and men mm -hmm. want want to dictate how women should behave how women should dress where sh should they go etc i mean this is part of the history so i would think that th there should be massive solidarity from french women i uh, I, I, I would hope to but it isn't what is happening in fact in france really? no. of, of course not because muslim women are not welcomed in the feminist uh, in movement. the feminist movement oh really yeah because they are oppressed women and because i mean they are not it's such free. an but it's such an anti intellectual analysis yes, it is an anti humanistic analysis it's anti fraternite analysis i'm just really kind of so you're really not being not allowed at all. In terms of natural allies, as Jamal was saying, we, we you don't feel like there's any natural we, allies. We in won't the have We won't really have feminist allies. I mean, and even if we try to use this narrative, because this is not a, an attempt. I mean, this is true. This is a feminist issue too. We won't receive any support, and uh, people would be indignated. Uh, I mean, they will be shocked and horrified by seeing us using this argument of feminism. How ironic since feminism actually started in, in France, really. Yeah. So how ironic is that? Right, well, so I think that's uh, actually one of the main uh, really interesting differences between the US and France mm -hmm. in uh, civil rights uh, and the struggle of minorities to kind of gain access to their mm -hmm. rights and to their own power, is that for Muslims in France, I, in, in my personal experience in our fight against Islamophobia, it's extremely um, sectarian in the way that it doesn't, s other communities don't seem to coincide or support it, and it seems to be very much every community for itself yeah, in it minorities. Is. There are um, communities of Muslim feminists, obviously, that, you know, inside the Muslim community yeah, are by promoting, by right, their, by their own. They won't, they won't. That's uh, the key. They won't join the the the, the global well feminist white feminism. I think it's the other way around. I think it's white feminism won't um, accept them, I mean. accept accept Muslim feminists in the same way because m Muslim women in themselves exemplify patriarchy, and mm. therefore they are almost the same enemy as the patriarchy because by wearing a hijab or by you know being a practicing Muslim you are giving into the patriarchy in a way that in itself is supposed to exclude you mm. from feminism where actually this is where we need feminism the most, the most right? right? It's to fight the common enemy yeah. and that's one of the struggles yeah. we do have in France. Yeah. So what's the solution? I mean it looks like an uphill battle. I know <laughs> I know and that's why one of the reasons you're here because obviously you know at least our listeners we have our own issues and then there is that global solidarity because we understand I mean you're coming here to show that uh, two people who understand the issue yeah. mm -hmm. and in general this is what we try to do through 
Uh, and you mentioned something actually very important. I'm going to go back to it later, which is the role of the media, because mm -hmm. that's how we feel mm. our role as part of the media to educate, you know, and to, to, do, to demystify, to all these things, People. to confront. Mm -hmm. And then if the media is part of the enemy, which yeah. is which is going to be a very dangerous thing, that, that they, or in fact, they are the ones who are pouring gasoline over the really? fire all the time, that's a major challenge. So I'm trying to think, aside from educating, aside from going out, aside, you, you're hitting obstacles with the laws. Like we mentioned, somebody can lose their job, right? Because she's mm -hmm. wearing a hijab. Mm -hmm. How do you fight it? I mean, there, I mean, through the legal system, if you're not also getting this uh, support from the community, there, there isn't an outreach. I think there are as many activists as there are ways to fight it. I think every <laughs> activist will have their own way of fighting it. I think whether it's uh, online fighting online hate speech, mm -hmm. uh, using the laws as a legal weapon against Islamophobia, because today, although the law is being manipulated in an Islamophobic uh, way, uh, originally the law is on our side. Originally yeah. the law is for the practice of religion in all freedom. Mm -hmm. Originally the law is against discrimination. So mm -hmm. we do have legal yeah. tools. Um, we as can long use as you can prove it. And right, of well, that was very, going to be my battle. that it's was going to battle. be my my question. Even some would say we believe this sometimes. The judicial system can be co-opted by patriarchy. Of course, right? of course, that's mm -hmm. no breaking news. So it, is it the same in France where maybe the, <coughs> the laws are really, even though what they say on paper, really aren't structured because of who controls the judicial system, has not been as a source of support to fight some of these things well, in France? Well, we have a very different judicial system, especially in one point is, I think, um, judicial independence. Uh, yeah, we don't have that here. Right, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the yeah, kind of influence that. that, you know, a hypothetical presidents could have on a hypothetical amount attorney of attorney general yeah and judges yeah we don't have yeah, no. judicial independence no, our, here. our judges go through a different kind of school and oh. they go through a different kind of test to become judges and they're not uh, politically appointed? appointed okay except judges are humans uh, mm. although the concept is them being neutral if you don't have any kind of background in fighting Islamophobia or discrimination or, or anti-racism you know, anti mm -hmm. or even, you know, if you have, if you're misogynistic in, in yourself, of course, the kind of judgments that you'll render will, you know, be, have, have that influencing them, of right? Of course. But again, we have a different judicial system, meaning that we also don't rely so heavily on precedent. Mm. We rely very heavily on laws because it's a civil law country, mm. not a common law country. Um, I do believe that when you are going to court for an Islamophobia case, you will have a tougher time than another mm. kind of more mainstream anti-racism case. And I think worst, I think it's risky to go to the to go to court for an Islamophobic case because it could turn into a law. It could turn into mm -hmm. a bill against uh, you. Uh, right. If you're going to to court because you've been discriminated at work, because you wear a hijab, a headscarf, mm. it could turn into, well, but it is true that uh, it's problematical to wear a, a, a hijab a, a, at work because this is not laicity and stuff and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it could turn into a law. And so the main, the main stake for us at CCIF is fighting, is preventing any other Islamophobic laws, because mm -hmm. you know that France is the is the first European country. I know. To I'm have still in shock. Laws. But but I'm in I shock. mean, France on, on the other hand has uh, strict laws, for example, uh, anti-Semitism laws. Yes. And people were actually these laws don't even exist in this country uh, because uh, even though uh, there is a lot of hate speech, but Sometimes even hate speech is protected under the First Amendment mm -hmm. in this country. But in France, for example, denying the Holocaust, that's one example, gets you a in sentence, jail. a jail sentence, and then other things. So why, I'm trying to say, to, to see the logic between uh, having these laws when it comes to anti-Semitism and then when it comes to Islamophobia, they are non-existent. Non well, so in the... In 
if we're replacing the debate in a legal framework, mm -hmm. the same laws that apply to anti-Semitism are supposed to apply to Islamophobia because it's against hate speech, against religion, race, gender, sexual orientation, etc. Mm -hmm. The list goes on. There's a huge list of criteria. So religion would mean Jewish faith, Muslim faith, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, then there's the ethnic side to it on, you know, Jewish ethnicity or whatever. Um, Holocaust denial is something else. Of course, it's linked to anti-Semitism, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's linked to France's history. Um, and you, we, it isn't so much to do with Islamophobia. I think it's, if we're replacing the debate of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, it would be more in uh, the way the media deals with it than mm -hmm. the way the law deals with it. Because the law, when you look at it, black on white, when you look at the text, it's supposed to deal with it in the same way. It's more how people perceive the law mm -hmm. and how the media perceives the law. Mm -hmm. You're listening to the voices of Shafika Atalay and Isis Kar. They are all the way here in San Francisco from Paris, France, and they are from the collective to against, against uh, Islamophobia so my in France. So my question... And we you're listening basically also to... I just want to greet our uh, viewers on Facebook, Facebook Live, Live yeah. and other platforms. Um, is there any good news here? Because, <laughs> I mean, where is the good news? I mean, the fact that the two of you in your organization are fighting this is good news. But what I'm hearing from you is that lack of allies... Uh, lack of uh, societal support, increasing Islamophobia, I mean, basically uh, a gendered attack on Muslim women. It seems like it's, I don't see anything, any as we say here, where is the good news? The good news is you got to start somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I think there are some good news. I think the good news is that we have allies. We have strong allies, European allies. We have... Some, oh, out, from outside France. Yeah, from outside France. We are working with a lot of organizations, a lot of countries, and we are advocating at the European Commission, at the European Parliament. We are... We are using our rights, using our expertise to uh, have kind to 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 be able to be able to recognize Islamophobia because the first step to combat Islamophobia is the recognition of Islamophobia, a definition of Islamophobia, a resolution on Islamophobia. We are working on it. We have a lot of partnerships all around Europe, and now we have partnerships in the U.S. This is good news. I think that another news is that we are raising awareness, but not mm -hmm. only us, not only CCIF, but also the other organizations that work on, on, on uh, Islamophobia. We are raising awareness mm -hmm. everywhere. And I think that now people is more aware than it used to be before. Right. And people is more concerned. For example, if you see, if you look at the French Muslim communities, because there is no a community, there are communities, right. they are much more aware of what they, they, what they used to be. Now they are interested in their rights, how to defend themselves uh, to, uh, in front of uh, an Islamophobic situation. They go to conference, they go to trainings, they, they, they want to defend themselves. They want to assert their rights. This is something that, in my view, is improving. Yeah, I think that, I think that um, Muslims in France know their rights better. I think that we've been working a really long time to achieve that. And in terms of good news, I'm thinking of the March Against Islamophobia that mm -hmm. we organized uh, mm -hmm. at the end of 2018, yes. 2019, sorry, where we got um, 30,000 to 40,000 people in it's the amazing. streets. Mm -hmm. And it's it amazing. wasn't only Muslims. Right. It yeah. was people. It was, all, uh, it was, I it mean, was France. All, it was It was France. Yeah. And so that's what France is supposed to be like. That's what France, that's what my parents taught me France was, right? And it was really good to see in French streets people marching against. The only reason they were marching against was Islamophobia. And it was people from all spectrums of society, from all faiths, from all religions, from all genders. And they were all there fighting this, co this cause that we're fighting against. And but it was Paris, right? Well, yeah. there were no, well, no, no there were it was nationwide. From, it was, oh, nationwide. was nationwide. They were coming from other part of France. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and I think that beyond Islamophobia, it was just a matter of human rights. Uh, yeah. Globally, it was human rights, and people felt concerned, even though they weren't 
Muslims. So you're raising, re really, you're raising awareness. That's the first objective, right? That's raising awareness, educating people. Absolutely. How much does uh, the anti-immigration sentiment play into also mm. the, the, the spike in, in Islamophobia? I think that's the since, engine of it. Since the so-called Arab Spring and seeing a lot of uh, Syrian uh, refugees and so forth. I mean, because I, I've actually... You know, going to, to France and Paris, so larger numbers of basically in, in new immigrants. And this is the same engine that you're talking about. That, the engine, I think. That Trump administration uses here, the anti-Mexican, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, Muslim ban and whatever. So there must be a connection. It's kind of like part of this global connection with anti-immigration. Mm -hmm. I feel like there is a connection. Obviously, they are Arabs. They are perceived as Muslims. So obviously, it it emphasizes this uh, sentiment of uh, Islamophobia. But I think that more importantly, uh, this background of immigration comes from our parents when they came from Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia. They were Arabs, and I think that Islamophobia is just a new racism. I think that before mm -hmm. in France, it was just racism against. Arabs in general, mm -hmm. and then it it turned like maybe more uh, politically correct to say racism against Muslims, and now we have kind of abandoned the notion of Arabs. Now we try to um, prioritize the, the notion of Muslims, but for me it's the same racism. It's just the continuation, the continuity. So yeah, there is this connection, this obvious connection between immigration and Muslims may be reinforced now since the Arab Spring uh, in France and all around Europe and, and uh, specifically in the east of here, in the Eastern Europe. Uh, yeah, there is this so, obvious connection. So, no, go ahead. Um, is that, no, of yeah. course, please. Um, I, I do agree. Obviously, it's heavily linked to immigration and to co the colonial history of France, obviously, mm. you know, colonizing different northern African countries. Today, I think that um, specific to France, uh, and this is a difference with the U.S., is that it's heavily linked to Islam as a religion. Mm -hmm. um, today, you'll see completely disconnected, well, not completely, obviously, because it's influenced, but disconnected to immigration, you'll see problems with practicing Islam, whether you are an you are a migrant, whether you're a French national, whether you're a convert or a Muslim or a person that was born Muslim, mm -hmm. um, it's heavily linked to the practice of religion. Today, there's the state wants to control uh, much more heavily um, yeah. imams in France uh, and mosques in France, and that is really linked to a problem Fr France has with Islam. France sees the practice of Muslim faith, although this is completely untrue, the practice of Muslim faith as incompatible mm -hmm. with the values of the French Republic and with being French. That means that France is essentially asking French Muslims to choose between their French self or their Muslim self. How anti-France. Right? Unbelievable. Yeah. Because the whole point of France, you didn't have to choose. Yeah, yeah, that's what the 1905 law is. Right. Is, you know, giving people the freedom to be whatever faith they want to be and French at the same time. Yeah, I would say it is anti-France. Yes, I'm not. I think that <laughs> when, when you talk... Well, anti the concept of France. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anti what stand France supposed to stand what for. What it stands oh, for on you. paper. I mean, in mm. fact, when you talked about the... The, the motto of France, like uh, liberty, like liberté, fraternité. Uh, I, I think that it's bad for them. It's just integration. They just want integration, no matter your cultural background, your religious background. They want you to put it aside mm -hmm. and just to be a French, right? And wiping your well, cultural identity. Well, a particular identity. kind of French. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Their kind, kind of French. Their, Their kind, kind of, of French. French. Right. The unique kind of French. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So tell us if people listening want to get more information about your organization mm -hmm. or they want to learn more and become allies mm -hmm. from here, what do you recommend? Um, so we do have a website. We do have a website do you have a website we're translating that, in English. Okay, yeah. I was just going to say, English most version. Americans don't. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. get that. That's Sorry okay. about that. That's all right. You're, That's you all guys right. speak English, then most of us speak 
French, so well, we need help. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Um, the, we're translating in English currently, and there's already um, we do annual reports uh, on all the f data we have on Islamophobia in France. That we already have uh, translated multiple uh, reports yeah. that are on our website. Can you give the website name out? Yeah, ccif.com. That's easy. That's, that's easy. easy. Yes. Yes, That's you can find the, the, the English version. CCIF.com. Yeah, Collective Against Islamophobia in France. Islamophobia mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The Collective Against Islamoph Islamophobia in France, or CCIF.com, you will. So people can get a lot of the information. And I, I actually looked at it. There are uh, things that are published in English there. Mm -hmm. yes. It's not everything is in French. And with today, with all these different tools, even though it's not perfect, you can't translate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. I had to. I, ha I had to recommend don't Google say Translate. Don't but, say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. No, say we have it. translated but, but multiple are, reports. But until yeah, you know, you'll get. But you'll get a very good uh, idea. You you spoke about coalitions. I want to go back to the coalition things. Are you making headway with different communities? With it? like for us. You know, for Arabs and Muslims in this country, we have natural partners like uh, uh, the Latinx uh, uh -huh. communities, uh, the African American communities, and so forth. I mean, are you making, you know, uh, basically partnerships with these communities? Because I know a lot of times we tend, meaning different communities, said, okay, now we're the target, we're the victim, uh -huh. uh, we'll live in our own bubble. Uh, for now and nobody else, uh, you know, like they'll, they'll be like outsiders mm -hmm. looking in. Yeah. So, like for example, people coming from Africa who are not Muslim, but mm -hmm. yet they face races, or, you know, the Basque people or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest. This is, I, I, I've noticed here that in the U.S. there is this, there, there is this help with each other's, with the uh, different communities. This is something that we don't really have in France and in Europe in general. But this is one of our uh, main objectives, to um, connect with the other communities, with the other coast. Mm. Uh, and right now we are connected with uh, the anti-gypsism uh, mm -hmm. movement, with the Afrophobia movement, with anti uh, with anti-Semitism movements, and also they do great job. They have, in okay. in a sense, paved the way for Islamophobic uh, anti-Islamophobic movements. And we tend to follow their model. We tend to follow the work that they did and that they are doing. And uh, yeah, one of the new objective is to work along with them. So, uh, what do you think the reason is? I mean, do you think people just kind of like worried like kind of handling their own issues yeah i think that separately not seeing that uh, the benefits of solidarity i think it's more than that is it a um, I think it's more than that. I think that um, the media is portraying the Muslim community to be against every other community, meaning that you will see recurrent, very recurrent debates on how anti-Semitism is stemming from the Muslim community, how uh, the Muslim community is uh, homophobic, is against the LGBT community, how Muslim Arab Muslims would be uh, racist against uh, the black Muslims. So. It's more than that. It means that um, the white majority, the me the media basically, is pinning, is pitting the Muslim community against all the other communities in a way that, of course, if you pit one against each other, they're not going to want to help the Muslim community if they see their the Muslim community as being against their cause. So I think that is the origin of why minorities in France have a hard time working together is because we're constantly put in this kind of arena to fight against each other. Divide and conquer. Divide and conquer, right? Be because obviously it would be much more efficient if we joined forces and fought the common enemy. But, but also I think there is a, a huge lack of organization in France and in Europe that um, that isn't present in the US. In, in France and Europe, we have this lack of organization. Uh, people feel like, uh, feel like they, are, they, have, they are overloaded with work and they don't have time to dedicate themselves to another cause or to uh, try to find the benefits of uh, collaborating with another, another cause. I have the feeling that it's changing now, but for me, there is also this aspect of lack of organization. What would you recommend if you were speaking to the uh, 
our audience right now, what would you want the take-home message to be? What do you want them to get from listening to you today? What is your hope? What is your wish? I think we're hoping from a solidarity between the Muslim community and the French community to help out where mm. we need help. Um, we're hoping for awareness to be raised on the situation in France for us to be not left alone with this burden on our shoulders. It's a huge burden. Mm -hmm. It's a huge burden that we fight daily and we need help picking up the slack. We need help fighting mm -hmm. this. We need more people to start thinking about this issue. The more we are, the more power we have, mm -hmm. the more people we have, the more thoughts we have on the issue. So maybe there'll be fresh new takes on how to fight this. Obviously, there's a different kind of Islamophobia, and we're at different levels uh, in France and in the U.S., and maybe some accomplishments that have been made in the U.S. could inspire what we're doing mm -hmm. in France, and the opposite, too. So maybe we have a situation that we could help with because we have already gone through mm -hmm. it, et cetera. It's right. a collaboration and uh, raising awareness, I guess, on the situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's part of this whole global justice and the indivisibility of justice, yeah, really, that exactly. uh, we all aspire to, to achieve. Now, you being here, I'm going to kind of flip uh, uh, the image a little bit and, and talk a little bit about your kind of uh, impression. Of the Islamophobia of, of, here. Of, uh, not just Islamophobia, but now you've been here, you've been meeting with different members of mm -hmm. the Arab American community, the Muslim American community. What's your take on this? Be honest. <laughs> if, you know, what's your yeah. take? I mean, this is also don't be politically compare correct. and contrast because you talked about certain things that you've seen here, maybe inspired you or certain things that you've or seen here or disappointed you, you or whatever. But it, you definitely, as a, as someone looking from the outside in, what do you feel? All right. If I may, I'll yes. answer the question on an individual level. Hmm speaking from from my experience uh, I'm a veiled woman and when I'm in France I feel like everybody's suspicious with me I like when every when a single person is smiling to me I'm like happy because mm -hmm. people smile mm -hmm. and I when I arrived here in in California I said to my colleague Isis that everybody is so it's so nice. so nice here, everybody look at me, everybody smile at me, telling me, me you're pretty. Telling me I'm pretty with my headscarf and stuff, and this doesn't happen in France. Yeah. So I feel that's like sad. that's so sad. sad. That's sad to need to come all this way to feel this. Feeling. I know, that's that is sad. sad. But feeling of belonging, right? Feeling of belonging, feeling of being normal, <laughs> to be honest. Fe feeling yeah. of being like anybody. Mm. To be normal. So I feel like this the situation in, in the US is mm. less critical for now. Well California. Else. California. Ca uh, very yeah. yeah. Or the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. In the Bay Area. It's a little different here because if you go outside it would be like France. Ah, maybe. So, so, so I've chosen the, the great you, state for, <laughs> yeah. for today. And the great area here the in the Bay Yeah, San, San Francisco, ab ab absolutely. Well, I want to uh, hear the same analysis yeah, from, from ISIS. From, from ISIS. Mm -hmm. um, What's your impression? So I do have the same impression. Really? Uh, I do wow. have the same impression where uh, I do feel much safer as a Muslim uh, in, the area. Area. in the Bay Area. I'm saying the Bay Area. Okay, as long as in you the say Bay, Bay area. Area, area than in France, I do feel much safer. Everywhere we walk, we you know we stop in you know cafes diners whatever and there's signs written you are safe here you mm -hmm. know terrorism comes in all forms meaning you know not only uh, right. Muslim terror mm -hmm. Islamic terrorism quote unquote right um, but also white uh, white uh, supremacy etc there is a feeling of personal safety that mm. I personally have here that I don't have in France however That's sad. It's very sad to think that the U.S. is better than anywhere in this term. It's in sad. this, in, in that's this how bad, movement, but that's how bad it bad, is in France right, right it's now. It's bad. Yes, it means that it you you feel so unsafe in France. But, okay, you know how people think of their discussions in the shower. You kind of go over what may happen or what has happened, mm -hmm. right? I constantly go over what will happen if I will be discriminated against or attacked because I'm a Muslim. Whether that's because I'm in a scenario, you know, whatever, in a mosque or, or not, etc. It's terrible. However, on 
a more general sense of the term, because this is our personal experience yeah. being in the U.S. for a couple of days. I feel like um, the U.S. Ha is coming from a different place, obviously, because it doesn't have the, have the same history. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like the war on terror, terror in the sense of foreign policy, affects Islamophobia extremely heavily. Yes. Where I almost feel like in France, it's a little more. Um, focused on, religion. Focused on f religion, right? And this is about foreign policy, and this is about the relation between the U.S. and the Middle East, and the relations between the U.S. and the world. Yeah. Uh, I think I talked to you earlier when we were speaking in, at San Francisco State University, and I was actually surprised when I asked you if you have a representation in the government yeah. within the system, and you told me very little, and those mm -hmm. who are actually representing the community are not doing well, much to help. Like mm -hmm. like for us, for example, you know, f it was a big uh, success and pride for people to see Ilhan Omar mm -hmm. to yeah. be the first uh, It was Muslim a pride woman. for us, and we're not and, even, and I mean. To be a member of Congress, and Rashida Tlaib to, to, to go, and both of them, Ilhan Omar wears, wears her hijab. Uh, and they have to, by the way, change a law to allow her mm -hmm. because there was mm -hmm. a law preventing people from wearing hats for men in the past and whatever. And then for Rashida Tlaib to wear her Palestinian embro embroidered dress mm -hmm. as a sign of her pride that she's both an American and Palestinian, and Ilhan Omar, both an American and a Somali Muslim woman. And then, you know, to, to just to learn, like, actually don't have that in France with all the numbers at least I have it in my mind that there are so many people from Al Algerian descent Moroccan descent you know from the Maghreb that you don't have that there is very little room for a Muslim uh, politician for Muslim um, political activity in in France I think I think that even even if we have some Muslim elected people they have to kind of hide their Muslimness. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't uh, run based on that. No, of course not, because they will they will have to apply the principle of uh, laicity, they will have to apply the principle of neutrality. Mm -hmm. So they won't yeah, they won't run under their Muslimness mm -hmm. at all. And unfortunately when we have this kind of people coming from our communities, could be the cultural communities, Arabs the Arab community or from the Muslim community, they won't do much for the Muslims. They won't do much for the community. And even though they could turn in, uh, they could turn against them. They could, they could literally, literally, sorry, become the enemy of the community. Wow, this, this is, is harsh. A shame. This is well, harsh. That's very harsh. Yeah, this is harsh. Th that is the case. Um, and I think even, even further than that, obviously, because of the notion of laicity you wouldn't be allowed to run and wear the hijab in parliament mm -hmm. or etc. Mm -hmm. uh, but more than that, it's that Muslims are considered to be, it's impossible for a Muslim to apply laicity. That's the kind of presumption. That's what you would think of a Muslim. A Christian could, you know, very much be neutral and could very much apply laicity, but a Muslim, impossible. You can't do that. And there's a, an absolute war right now, term used by the president a couple of days ago, against political Islam. Now, that is a notion that's extremely interesting because they have never defined it. So what is political Islam? They used to say that a hijab was political in itself. Um, so what does religious. Macron mean by that? So what he means so, by so that... So, Michael, just sorry, my quick question. So if, some, uh, if somebody wears the yamaka. Uh, who is Jewish? Is that means he's a political Jew? Is he or she, is he defined as a political Jew in France? You, you're not. I've seen a lot of uh, French Jewish people wearing their yarmulke. Uh, what yeah, about nuns? You know, I mean. So that's really interesting. Is that there was a case? Uh, I think it was a couple months ago. Um, a couple months ago, about a nun who had applied to be in mm -hmm. a retiring retirement home, mm -hmm. uh, and who was denied because she wore a, a headscarf. And that was really interesting. People were outraged. Now that that's, got national that's attention. That's okay to be outraged. It was, I mean, but also it's ridiculous. But it's ridiculous for a nun the same way as it's ridiculous for a woman of the same age that would be Muslim applying to a retirement home, right? However, she received excuses, things that. But she received Muslim apologies. Never, she received apologies. Never received. So there is definitely exceptionalism. 
Yeah, that's I one guess. thing. And, race, and, and races. It's called Christian exceptionalism. You know, I, I just say when, you, when you're targeting one community, treating them differently. Well, so what's used is that um, what France says a lot of itself, or what some people say of France, is that it has Christian Judeo roots. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Right? It means Christian and Jewish. Everything but, and nothing. <laughs> right. It, it means, means Christian and Jewish. It okay. means white. It yeah. means... Because the roots of France is deep in colonial history, right? No one asked to be invaded. <laughs> well, right, for, uh, they uh, did especially, invade. especially since at one point they considered Algeria as part of France. As, of course. They weren't thinking of Algeria as a as a colony. They wanted to, they annexed it pretty much so, right? Yet somehow <laughs> they invaded Northern, uh, North and, Africa, uh, but now today Muslims are seen as the invaders. And never apologized, which I, I have to say uh, for the history of colonial history in uh, terrible history where more than a million and a half Algerians basically died Mm -hmm. and also the Algerian French citizens that they killed and threw in the same river Mm -hmm. that it's still a very uh, black stain on Mm -hmm. the history. It's recognized very little talked about. It's now recognized we've achieved to a level where you know it's accepted as truth which Mm -hmm. wasn't the case very recently but uh, but very it's, it's not talked about that much. Mm-hmm. So you've been listening to Arab Talk here on KPOO, San Francisco, 89.5 FM. It's Arab Talk with Justin Jamal. Jamal, this has really been a great show. Yes, and uh, thank you for coming We really here. appreciate you coming. Thank you for hosting, you for hosting us. Just but we're also us. very so sad <laughs> about, I mean, to hear that two French women have to come to California to feel at home two French Muslim women Mm -hmm. have to come to the Bay Area to feel safe. Mm -hmm. This is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. um, And it's really a black stain on France Mm -hmm. and Europe right now. It really is. We are supposed to be the country of human rights. And today we can see that we are frowned upon. And we are seen as, you know, as you said at the beginning of the show, France is potentially one of the worst countries in terms of Islamophobia. And that means a lot coming from a country that, you know, led the revolution for human rights. But you are always welcome here. You, you, Thank you, you, you very should know much. That. You're always welcome here, always welcome on the studio. la liberté, fraternité, égalité, our guests for the entire hour, uh, Shafika Atelay and Isis Carr from CCIF, Collective Against Islamophobia in France. You've been listening to Arab Talk on KPO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. Make sure to go to our website, arabtalkradio.com, to download all, all the our podcasts. platforms, iTunes, SoundCloud. Uh, we're also on, we also broadcast on uh, Facebook Live every Thursday, 2 to 3 p.m. But you can listen to all of our shows from our SoundCloud account. Thank you, and we'll see you next week.